For over four years now, I have carried this torch of social evolution. How I have maintained my sanity in the face of such ignorance is beyond me. Once more I find myself driven to share the insights that have sharpened my focus, and here is the story of just one activist determined to make changes. My name is Adamantium and I'm a progressively intentioned human being, or as we call it in this current society, an activist. And I advocate the application of the scientific method to social and environmental concern. Essentially, I began with while while listening to the radio shows that would uh, that would come out about uh, the zeitgeist movement and the application of a resource-based economy, I'd listen to these radio shows and I'd be and I'd be inspired to want to do that sort of thing myself. So I've started thinking to myself, right, well, let's you know, let's see if I can create a podcast show or a radio show. I mean, it's, I've never done this kind of thing before. I mean, um, when I was growing up, I used to I I was heavily involved with. Uh, Amateur dramatics and performing arts and all that sort of stuff. So, who was who was uh, the people who you saw who you thought I'd like to to, to do a bit of that? Uh, it was mainly mainly Peter Joseph and Neil Kiernan. Of uh, basically Peter Joseph, he's the, he was the guy who founded the Zygos movement. And he did he started off the uh, the global radio show, and now it's opened up to other hosts as well. And Neil Kiernan hosts the um, the radio show called V Radio. And he basically already had a radio show that he used to do because he used to um, you know, have shows about uh, libertarianism and free market capitalism, all that, all that sort of like American politics sort of stuff. And then he discovered the Zeitgeist movement and became an advocate for it. So he does shows like that. And I got in, and I got very, um, very uh, inspired by those people to say, yeah, I mean, you know, I love talking. So how about if I create something where I talk? You know, see what kind of contribution I can make, and that's that was basically the first step. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a public announcement on behalf of the mainstream media. We would like to apologize for lying to you every single day of your lives in order to keep you scared of everything and anything. We do apologize for that. We're told by the corporations to keep you scared because if you're scared, then uh, you're more controllable. And if you're more controllable, then you're more likely to spend money you don't have on things you don't need in order to keep the economy going. So we're sorry for keeping you scared. We're sorry for trampling on your, uh, on your, you know, intellectual freedom. And we promise never, ever, ever to do it again. Well, well, well I, th I think we might make a, a fresh start Monday morning because we've already got the news for tomorrow and uh, in the bag. I wasn't really that aware of any um, of any independent media in this country. Um, granted, I I found out about l many 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 different forms of alternative media in this country. Like, for example, uh, um, the Wide Shut webcast by um, Keelan Balderson. That's What's that? I've never heard of that. Uh, it's essentially a, um, it's got a bit of a sort of New World Order spin on it, but it's a very interesting radio show did by, done by um, Keelan Balderson, and he's English, and, uh, and he does uh, a pod podcast show as well, along with some, you know, like uh, street activism. But I, um, I, w I became aware of things, uh, things like that and other, uh, other like non-mainstream things, like other... Um, other people even in the movement and uh, and I and then I heard of Charlie Veach and the Love Police um, I first saw there the, there was a video called uh, everything is okay montage and it was basically a montage of clips from of, of megaphone activism between Charlie and Danny 
and you know by this time I was already doing my podcast and okay, so myself, for the, sorry just for the people who, who, who maybe never heard of the, the Love Police Charlie mm-hmm. Beach and, and, and Danny Shine yeah, yeah, um, and if they haven't I recommend they'll they, they zip off to YouTube and, and after yeah. finish this type in everything <laughs> is okay montage and have a, have a good giggle yeah. could you say a little bit about, about the sort of way what, what, what Charlie and Danny did or, or do uh, uh, essentially uh, you'll see you'll see in that video that um, it's essentially a, a montage clip of loads of different pieces of megaphone activism that they that they've done like speaking in public on a megaphone and filming themselves and some of the insightful and ironic things that they would say and it and I found a, a lot of it very 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 funny it was it was both informative and entertaining because especially for one thing it's not something you see every day a guy speaking on a megaphone in the middle of a town center especially in london the most surveilled city in the world i think possibly besides the vatican that's a sovereign (coughs) state of itself um but i i saw that and i was really inspired by that and even more so because you know they weren't Psychos movement activists, and so it it inspired me to seek um, my own means of a sort of mirror image of it, as it were, of what they're doing to sort of incorporate their methodologies into my activism. What could I do by you know utilizing that um, that approach and putting a sort of psychos movement tint on it? As you can imagine, I've actually received a hell of a lot of criticism just for advocating a sustainable world. It's not surprising when you think about it, because the dominant structure has to defend itself, otherwise it wouldn't be a dominant structure. When it comes to some of the things that I encounter when on the street, it can be quite inane, such as this. Okay, so... Well, I'm in a public area, sir. You're a pint. As per... Sir, can you listen, You're an please? Absolute pine. As per, I'm listening to you all morning. As per, uh, listen to. I've only, you I've only been going for five minutes. I've, I've, what, what it is, I've got I to listen to you all morning. Here, right? I haven't been here. I, you're saying I've morning, got to listen sir. to you all morning. I make a point of starting at noon, meaning oh, I'm not here during the morning. All right, I'll, I'll make a point of starting at nine because I'm working for a living. That's what I'm yeah. doing. And all this I'm trying is, to do and is get a And this is what I do, as per Article Ten, as per Article Ten of the Human Rights Act. Your the human freedom. rights, my human rights are the same. I don't have to you listen to you. You don't have to listen to me. So why don't you go and do it somewhere else? And then I ain't got to listen we're to you. you ain't got to listen to me. We're in a public area. I can we do this if do I want. We ain't got to do it. We're in a public area, sir. Well, I can do whatever I want. But the online world takes the biscuit, really, in being the one place that I've received the most amount of criticism, purely because it's an arena which you can criticise from afar and being anonymous at the same time. Here's just a handful of some of the criticisms and abuses that I have received in the past. You're an argument looking for a fight, and one day you are going to piss the wrong person off one day, and they will hurt you. I did not threaten you, you stupid idiot, but when you do piss this person off, I hope I can watch you get knocked out. Are you implying that I have a mental age of a four-year-old? Excuse me, but which one of us goes round like a little kid rambling on about super duper magical robots that will do all their homework for them and shoot lasers out of their arse or whatever? It's not me, and even little kids stop doing that the time they turn 10. You're like 30 and you're still doing it. You clearly have too much time on your hands. Go and get a job. Oh, and that microphone made by a big corporation. Why do you have a murderer printed on your t-shirt? You are a complete gonk. Do you really have nothing better to do than harass police, waste their time and annoy everyone? You really are a knob. Well done on your arrest last month, by the way. I look forward to hearing about any more. Wow, dude. Imagine if you had a full-time job. You wouldn't need to spend all your time shouting in a megaphone and filming people. Wouldn't that be awesome? Stop talking sh- All activists talk sh- Get on with life and get a job. Lazy layabout sponger. Does this useless sh- have a job? Adam, you sound like a complete tit. Oh, Adam, do shut up. There you go again, blah, blah, blah. Your arrogance is second to none. 
Your threat to block me sees me being a lot happier without someone who thinks they are always right. One day you will look back on this and wonder, did I ever give anyone the time of day? Last word man, eh? Whatever. Go and find real life, it's out there somewhere and while you're there maybe a job wouldn't go amiss too. Bye bye Mr Know-it-all. You can't attack the root cause the roots you gave was a load of shit. You are basically saying kids ask for it. Well if I ever hear you have been raped, don't expect me to feel sorry for you. I will say oh well, he must have asked for it. It's not the rapist's fault, he doesn't deserve to be punished, now stop talking to me, I want to eat my steak. Wow, big words little boy, shame you couldn't put your brain into gear before you opened your big mouth. As for you being British like some clever little you thought you would avoid the answer and play some silly immature game about borders. You are just another slave son. Difference between me and you son is I'm not stuck in that whole of a country with mouthy little guys like you. I live in a beautiful country. It's idiots such as yourself that need a good slap. Maybe you should go over your smart ass remarks and see how many individuals particularly interacted with your pathetic remarks. You just made yourself look like a complete and even spasm pissed on your remarks. Star Trek lol. I have a pleasant life, I was born here, lol. So f proud of a country and monarchy. Let me guess, I bet you was at the front of the parade on the Jubilee, waving a flag like a complete And some of you can be forgiven for thinking that I'm a bit mad for saying this. Good. <laughs> I'd rather be considered insane by this culture, okay? This culture that uh, continually perpetuates hatred, fear and war against its fellow human beings. This culture that thinks itself superior to every other life form on the planet. This culture that actually just sits by apathetic while things slowly get worse and worse and worse in this country. And just says, oh that's the way it is. I'd rather be considered insane by that culture. Because as Jiddu Krishnamurti once said, it is no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. And it's true, our society is actually, in a sense, mentally ill. Because we've gorged ourselves for far too long on the values of apathy and materialism and hatred. And we wonder why we're so miserable all the time. Is it any surprise why you know, depression is such a, such a rampant problem. We don't actually embrace the positivities in life. No wonder we're depressed. As I've grown up, I've never been the kind of person who knew exactly how to behave in any given situation. Uh, I've had, you know, a sort of almost an an innate inability to gauge the rules of etiquette um, but I I try and see things from everyone's point of view while trying at all times to maintain my own integrity to basically be truthful you know honest and respectful as much as I possibly can even though there are many 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 interrelating factors in human interaction a great deal of which I don't understand off the top of my head in any particular situation. I have to think about it first and then like realise. Uh, and that's why a lot of my stuff is done on the fly and there's a lot of things that I miss and a lot of things I don't notice and a lot of things I forget to say and forget to do because I'm in the moment, I'm trying to figure it out as it goes. And, and I try and basically put across a positive uh, front, as it were, but it also has a boundary of, you know, come on, let's be civil, let's communicate, please. Can we please, can you know, communicate? And I try and like go through, go through that sort of thing, and I present my present my points in a in an intellectually honest and respectful manner, and there people find that clashing. Like like you said, people don't like to to hear about this sort of thing because it's very foreign to them. So, 
there, there, there are two points that I want to, to, to touch on from there. One is uh, how, do you, how, how do you deal with people when they do react strongly or in unexpected ways? Yeah. Uh, and, and also maybe touching on um, the etiquette of, uh, as you mentioned, there's normal social etiquette and there's the etiquette of, of having a megaphone in a public place Absolutely. and wanting to engage people positively. Yeah. Um, so, what what um, what do you find are the biggest challenges when people don't engage you uh, the, the in the positive way that you'd like, or you do, um, do you challenge them, or is, is I occasion? I used to challenge people quite a lot. Um, I used, I mean, in a sense, because I was primarily very much influenced by Charlie Veach, and Charlie Veach would have quite, you know, unfortunately sometimes quite a confrontational energy to him and I would be in part, um, you know, influenced by that but then I, as I went along with the progression of my activism I started to try and adopt more of, um, more of a respectful and loving energy and sort of like, you know, interact with people as the adult instead of interacting with them as the child or as a parent, because there's a there's a um, there's a thing I can't remember um, which uh, psychologist uh, coined this this idea is that there's three levels of human interaction. There's if you act as the parent, if you act as the child, or if you act as the adult. Now, obviously, if I were to act in a way where I would be treating you like I'm your parent, then the then the sort of inert uh, inter interaction that is um, met like mode of interaction that is roused up by that is for you to react as the child and vice versa but there's the neutral point which is treating people like adults and when you treat someone like an adult it influences them to also treat you like an adult Good afternoon ladies and gentlemen this is a public service announcement on behalf of the Ministry for Love, Peace and Compassion a piece of advice to try and help make your world a little better is perhaps spend 60 seconds every day thinking about the things in your life that make you happy. Thank you. At first when I started I was quite fearful of the police because I, you know, like the vast majority of people I grew up being taught that the police are the authority and you have to obey them no matter what. Don't question them, don't talk back, you know, just you you know, you just gotta be yes sir, no sir, three bags full sir sort of thing. That's how I was raised, um, both by my parents and by society, but you know, that there's you know, it's just a circumstance there. Um, you know, it's no one's fault. So in what so way did you uh, uh, did you have um I guess coming back to, to something I was, I was asking a little bit about earlier, mm -hmm. what were the things where you first realised that actually no, not all policemen could be trusted to be fair, not, not all authority figures could be trusted, mm -hmm. and that, that actually there was something that people needed to know about because mm -hmm. uh, it, it was such that... Uh, yeah, it was, when, it was when I started megaphoning in Worthing. Uh, the first... Uh, I can't remember whether it was the first time or the second time I did it. I had this piddly little 15 watt megaphone that I bought from Expressions for I think 12.99, and people could hardly hear me. And I was out by the bandstand in Worthing Town Centre, and uh, two female PCSOs approached me, and they were trying to take my details, and you know uh, they wanted to search me, and because by that time I'd heard a little bit about uh, the free man on the land thing and basically, you know, standing up for your rights. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have to give your details if you don't want to, as long as you've done nothing wrong. There's no yeah. reason to. So I started, you know, and I was, and my heart was just like pounding away in my chest because I'm like, I'm going to get arrested, I'm going to get arrested. But then I, was, I just, on, on the outside, I was just like, okay, just be calm, treat them with respect, you know. You know, this this is something that's very new to you, and it's something very very new to them. So, you know, we got to 
treat the situation with kid gloves as it were be as respectful as humanly possible and you know because I don't know how to talk myself out of it if they really try and belligerently assert something I won't be able to defend myself because I don't know enough at this point in time so um, I basically said you know um, I don't have to give you my, my details I've done nothing wrong um, you know is you know I'm uh, you know, and, I, and I didn't think at that point I should have videotaped it because that was a very interesting encounter and something that and you know after I'd finished um, I put my megaphone in a bag and I was walking back and I felt really paranoid because I kept like I heard a helicopter overhead and I was just like oh they're coming to get me <laughs> yeah and I, and I sort of like got inside and I was just like looking out the windows I kept thinking oh no I'd done something really bad when in fact I hadn't well, the police are ignoring me today. Or maybe they're not. Maybe they're just getting parked up, uh, getting ready to harass me. How I have been perceived by the authorities has mainly been that of some troublesome individual who has the balls to stand up and speak the truths of reality that he has discovered and ask legitimate questions about the functioning of our current socio-economic and value systems in a public place, such as a high street and through that act begun to spread seeds of a different way of thinking that ultimately threatens the cohesion and longevity of the current stagnant status quo. Initially such communications, especially through the medium of a megaphone, can have a jarring effect on delicate artificial values in the minds of some because it cuts through normality to reveal a differing approach. This understandably results in retaliation as I have already described, and the established authority, being the police, are called to deal with this perceived assault on our senses, intellect and cultural identity, since people consider their beliefs and understandings of part of who they are. The police are then in a position where they are charged with the task of attempting a subduing of the lawful actions of a human being because there is an establishment to protect and its installed defence mechanism of harassment, alarm or distress is used as an excuse to put a stop to said action, even if it is non-violent. I have endeavoured through every exchange with the, with the police to be as accommodating and receptive as possible, but it's got to the point of biased opposition and selective persecution reminiscent of the treatment of any forward-thinking individual by the established order who is willing to share their insights and thus influence the transition to a positive world. Here is some of the highlights of this process that I myself have personally experienced. Okay, I'm PC10025 Desmond Dalzell from Mason Police Station. I'm a town centre police officer. And I've been informed that you've been making comments on your bullhorn, which would be annoying to people, if not causing harassment, alarm, yeah. distress. And I'm just warning under the Public Order Act that if you carry on using language which causes anyone harassment, alarm, and distress, you may be arrested or get a ticket. May you I understand me? You'll understand if you carry on with the behaviour and somebody else complains because well, then we'll sir? take action towards them. No. I told you once, I won't tell you again, and then we can finish a little recording. If you cause any harassment, alarm, and distress, action will be taken. Your warning's been given, you understand me? No, I don't understand. Right. Then right. you leave home and walk. Alright, so here, is that the is that the border? What's what's the border of Fremlin Walk, madam? You're talking about your own. Just bit none of that. You don't really want you're gonna get yourself arrested if it's that. Under what law? You'd have to ask that one. So you're threatening me with arrest without knowing the law. Just leave it to it. You want to show, just leave it to it. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much, officers. But just, but just as a closer, is it okay if I ask for a hug? <laughs> Please. Right, what I was going to say is that you've been, you've had two members of the public that come in within a couple of minutes, right, and obviously arguing with yourself. Right, I don't want to cause no disturbances in this town. Okay, therefore, if we do, if I see other people coming up to you and obviously arguing with you and causing a nuisance, then I will have to ask you to friendly leave the location. So I don't want no problems or nothing escalated. However, and I will ask the question, sir, what law am I breaking by doing what I'm doing? It's just a friendly request. That's all it is. Okay? If it's a I'm request, not, I have the right I'm to not, decline, can I not? You're, you're, you're entitled to your own opinion. Okay, I'm not going to say that. Okay, however, if anyone here does find anything you're saying is offensive, then obviously we'll have to take action. However, I can't hear you very well with that because it's quite muffled. 
that's all I'm going to say. That's how I'm going to leave it. There's only going to be a 10 second chat. Right? Okay, well, you, you said your piece. Thank you very much, sir. Unfortunately, that's private property as well, mate, so. Well, what is private property? That's down there, that's why I've asked you not to film that. I'm, I'm sorry, you you have no authority to ask for my details. If I refuse, to, if I don't have to give you. I am not swearing, madam. Okay, but I've been told that, okay? okay. But that does not give you authority over yes, me. If somebody I'm, you something, I'm sorry, I'm, to I'm sorry. Considering that you have been you have been in the area for about 20 minutes or so? About two hours. Because I saw you, yeah. Um, have you heard me swear in that in that I time? I haven't, but if somebody in this so, I can, uh, I can, I may. I come over here to advise you. You are allowed to film, but would, yeah. you, would you give me your name and address and how long you're going if to you can, so If can you can prove, here if you can, to be and what you're doing it for. if you can prove if you that I have a lawful obligation to, then I will provide you okay, my details. You're not, you're not obliged to, but I just well, then there, well, I'm sorry, madam, there is no then point in asking for my details if I can prove it. children that they don't want to be filmed. So are the CCTV cameras. That, that's the concerns that some people have got. You've got all the rights to film. Mm -hmm. I'm asking you for your so, name and how long you're going to be. But I am not obliged to provide that information. Okay, that's fine. Okay. I'm saying to you, I thought it would be courteous if you could do it. Who, I'll tell you what, one advice I would give you is if you can contact the uh, the individuals who said I was I was swearing, Which maybe okay. maybe consider action against them for wasting police time. We'll see. Okay. okay. Well, thank you. thank you very much. Control, can you out for five? Ah. Thank you. Okay. What's your gripe now, officer? I haven't got a gripe. Mate. I've received a complaint from this lady here, and I've witnessed also the fact that you're shouting on your bullhorn today, and it's causing a noise nuisance to the lady and affecting her business. Um, I'll investigate that along with being a public nuisance and will report it to the relevant authorities obviously for you being a noise nuisance. Right, do sir? No, I do not understand. Right, if well, can, we can I? Lady, then we will effectively deal with you. Well, you since... Me? No, do I do not... No, I don't understand. Details? Am I obliged to give you I my details? Know your details, but I'm asking you, do you want to give me am I, details? Am I obliged to? Do you want to? Am I obliged You're to? I'm not going to get into one of these long, silly conversations. I'm just you. asking if okay. I'm obliged to, sir. I've asked you to do something. It's up to you whether in the... Okay, well, can I... Is it okay if I just ask you a couple of questions, sir? Okay. I've only just come to see you because uh, a little while ago, last time I saw you, you caused a few bits of alarm to people. So Such I just as? wanted to... You were arrested, weren't you? Do you remember that? Surely I would have been the one who was alarmed by that, right? right. I've just come to see you, see what your um, business is today, what you're, um, what you're talking about, and whether you, you know, just to make sure that you're not going to go down the route of tell you what, causing anyone, anyone. How about if you stick around and listen? Well, I can do, yeah? yes. Yeah. That'll be cool. No problem. Yeah, man. What uh, sparked the, the thirst to learn more about it so I can know what I'm talking about, I looked at. Uh, look towards YouTube for a source of information about how people have dealt with police and been, a and been able to, you know, um, end by even giving the police officer a hug, you know, when, you know, it was a situation where they could have had this, the cuffs slapped on them. And I started learning about that sort of thing, uh, watching a lot of what Charlie Veach did, and also looking into uh, the free man on the land thing. I was sent a, uh, uh, there's a copy of, um, well, there's a link to, uh, there's a talk by John Harris called It's an Illusion. And he goes through, it was like a, a, a presentation he did uh, in Stoke on Trent for BBC Five. And uh, it was basically a lecture about the uh, personal sovereignty, the birth certificate, legal lease, uh, common law versus, you know, uh, civil law, all that sort of stuff. And um, and that gave me a lot of food for thought, and I started digging into, you know, how a person can actually truly assert their rights, like about not just because uh, I already had the I already had the mentality in place where I was like, right, we just got to be calm. I also had to have the knowledge to back it up, so I started accumulating that knowledge. So and also from there, I think your next question was, um, do 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 do. Um, what inspired me to pick up a megaphone in the first place? Uh, well, from being very entertained and inspired by the Love Police, and knowing that you know, doing those sort of things, I, I res, I respect Ch Charlie Veach and and Danny Shine so much 
uh, for what they've for what they've done that it's inspired me to s pursue a similar uh, role for, um, for myself in the things that I do. And anyone who anyone who picks up a megaphone and is effective in using a megaphone, then you have my respect. There are quite a few people who use a megaphone that don't necessarily know how to use it properly and use it very badly. Like for example, there's an example of when Alex Jones went to, I think it was a libertarian rally, and he came there with two megaphones and he basically just stormed in there shouting about different bits and pieces and made the people look really, really stupid. You know, and people started accusing him of, him of being COINTELPRO because of that. But you know, the people who can use it, I really, I really respect, and it's inspired me to sort of like, you know, I mean, obviously, growing up, I've been, I've been very involved with performing arts a lot of my life, so I'm okay with crowds if it's a, if it's a sense that I'm in a, we're in a theatre and I'm on the stage and you're sat in the audience. I'm used to that sort of thing, but out in the street where people can come along and just punch me in the head if they want to. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, there are some people that have said to me that you're very, very brave to do what you do on the megaphone. There you are. Here's a question for you. How much freer and wonderful would your life be if you didn't have to worry about money? It would be brilliant, wouldn't it, if you didn't have to worry about money? So here's another question. Is it really money that we need? Or is it access to what that money would have bought that we actually need? I learned the lesson uh, slowly that I mean, when I first started me uh, megaphoning, before I incorporated the free hugs, I was basically just giving out earnest explanations of how the banking system works, how the poli uh, political system works, all that sort of stuff. I was just explaining stuff. I was just giving out information, and I wasn't really getting that much po that much positive feedback. People, you know, uh, um, you know, when I told people uh, about what I do, they they'd be like, "Well, why are you preaching to people?" And I immediately think, wait well, a minute, I'm not preaching. I, mean, I didn't think that I was. But in yeah. fact, I was preaching because what good is it to just give out information and not take any in? And even though I was completely open to people coming up to me and talking to me, but my conveyance on the megaphone was just giving out information. If someone came to talk, I would talk and I would share ideas and learn from them. But I wasn't doing that on the megaphone. So... I basically started thinking to myself, well, how can I turn it around and, uh, and get people to give in information to me? Well, how else do you do that? You ask a question. So why am I an activist? Well, first, let's discuss what the price of being an activist really is. The stress and potential conflict and even danger it entails. To begin with, living in this current paradigm and having the will and ability to walk your own path will have certain psychosocial implications such as alienation from those you interact with, meaning that you will be made to feel different from everyone else, creating an immediate negative state of an imposed feeling of separation from the group due to the difference in worldview. This serves as a means of social control. Being social creatures, the propensity is to avoid being an outsider and be part of the tribe, as it were, but when this group mind tendency is exploited for means of segregating and cutting out anyone who doesn't uphold the commonly held perceptions, that's when you get trouble. Disparity of communication, meaning that the differences will adversely affect the success of most communications between yourself and the rest of society. Have you ever been in what seems like a regular social situation where conversation is flowing and and you put your own two cents in, as it were, and it either goes right over their head or instantly causes an uncomfortable silence? Yeah, that is the signal of two differing frames of reference, thus resulting in a lower success rate of communications in general. Retaliation from those around you, meaning that communicating to your fellow man and woman a train of thought that could change things for the better can actually have a retaliatory effect 
where they impose physical, verbal, or even non-verbal violence against you to defend against how your worldview threatens the stability of their own artificially created and imposed values. If there's one thing that established and unchangeable values hate more, it's emergence. It is like the antidote to the poison that is dogmatic thought, and it's great to know that our culture already has a defence protocol for such occasions. So why put yourself through that? Surely it sounds like a huge drag and it's better just to just keep your head down and get on with your work like everyone else, right? Okay, here's why. Financial fraud. The very inherent functioning of our entire global banking system is an inflationary, cancerous and insidious pyramid scheme that is centuries old and is guarded from examination as the invisible religion, the holy trinity of cash, card and code. It functions by committing fraud at every step in its processes, perpetual inflation, debt creation and consolidation of currency, resources and power in the hands of the few can only lead to complete failure and collapse of the entire system itself. What I have just gesturally explained is the process of fractional reserve banking, compound interest and debt, and it is these horrors that lie at the very centre of the monetary market ethos, the nucleus of our financial system. And the hardest pill to swallow about this is that it has been in our faces all along and we never collectively realised. The illusion of money has been shrouded in obfuscation, meaning that it has been portrayed as so complex that the will to find out what it's about is overwhelmed and shut down, disguising and hiding the immoral and destructive attributes while operating in plain sight is the mark of any institution that cares only for itself and uses populations for those ends inevitably leading to suffering. As a result, they are not deserving of our sustained support. Inefficiency. This is one of the main things that the system requires, and when it comes to everything from the infrastructure to the very products we consume, efficiency must be continually held back because efficiency is inverse to the mechanics of profit. There are many examples of this. However, to give you one just off the top of my head, say you ran a company that manufactures and sells automobiles. Does it make sense to ensure that every vehicle you create has a clean propulsion system such as electric or even compressed air? that the materials used to construct the car itself are durable, strong and also recyclable, and also equipped with the technological capability to be self-driven. This technology has existed for decades now, by the way. That sounds like a good idea, so why don't we just use that approach for all cars manufactured and used? Well, let's factor into the equation first that you are a car company in a system based upon currency you need to stick to the bottom line of profit and self-preservation. So in order to capitalize, as it were, on the situation, you can cut corners in regards to worksmanship, funding and material quality so that whatever comes off your production line is already inherently flawed. So through the use of inefficient practice and materials, you have created a chain of repeat business for yourself. This is called planned and intrinsic obsolescence, and it is essential for profit to be accrued. This also has a knock-on effect, which while causing anywhere from minor inconvenience to death, such malfunctions create repeat business for other companies which are also created to service the problems inherent in the design and construction of cars such as the auto repair industry. If cars were made to be efficient, durable and as recyclable as possible, what need would there be for the service industry? And with the need for that industry gone, GDP would decrease and the system will be in big trouble. Waste. In a sense, waste is a byproduct of inefficiency due to the requirements for technical obsolescence. It is the fact that far too much of the Earth's resources 
that we extract, refine and use for consumed products and goods end up in landfill sites, piling higher and higher. This mechanism of using up materials and dumping them in a virtually unusable form is indistinguishable from flesh-eating viruses such as necrotizing fasciitis, which literally consumes and kills the cells of the body. Now I completely accept that there are some resources that cannot be recycled and reused. However, just because they are present in our ecosystem doesn't mean they should be used in the way that we are currently using them. For instance, carbon is the most common element in this galaxy. Carbon dioxide is the gas that is exchanged between human beings and plant life alongside oxygen. Now what would the reversal of that process result in? Can human beings exist breathing CO2 and trees breathing oxygen? No. So why do we think we can upset the balance and think it's okay to extract oil, coal and natural gas from the geology and just keep burning it? Violence. Violence is a byproduct of living in this current paradigm. You see, because this system is not designed to allow for everyone to enjoy a higher standard of living, there is inevitably a select percentage of the populace who will not have their life needs met at all and those who have to acquire their life needs by means of begging and or slavery in order to receive tokens of debt to then use them to purchase resources. And those people have a varying degree of success in this process. The resultant condition is something we know as scarcity. And within scarcity, we humans not only develop in potentially destructive and antisocial manners due to the psychosocial ramifications of not having our life needs met, but also coping mechanisms in order to deal with the scarcity and try to meet our needs in whatever way our experientially installed moral codes dictate. And as we have seen through history, those distorted values have proven to be highly destructive. War. Warfare is the orchestrated outgrowth of violence itself. It has been resorted to for many reasons, from simple ideological or religious differences, to the forced acquisition, otherwise known as theft, of the resources of others. There is also another facet of war in our modern culture, the act of making money off of war itself. Whether it is in the form of funding both sides of a conflict, such as with the resources used during the Second World War, or whether it's the near total destruction of an area and the carrying out of construction projects to build military bases and pipelines such as with the Iraq and Afghanistan occupations, war, as Smedley D. Butler famously said, is a racket. Ignorance. Ignorance is now not so much perceived to be a vice, but rather a virtue. We now live in a culture that would rather not know about certain things which are either outside the realm of conventional and materialistic schools of thought or directly oppose the established values, beliefs and understandings of the culture at any respective point in time. And the only thing that seemingly matters when it comes to whether any particular idea or piece of information is valid is whether the majority believe it. Anything outside of that is deemed as blasphemy against the social order, and considering the scope of the agreed set of acceptable data is incredibly narrow, it's inevitably that outside data must be rejected, for it threatens to force a jack into the gap and permanently rip it wide open. The culture's self-defense mechanism against this is not surprisingly the value that it is cool not to care. Unsustainability Inevitably, the mathematical reality of our current paradigm is one of an unsustainable model of infinite growth and infinite consumption on a planet of nearly finite resources. But this is not acknowledged in the larger scale because this growth is crucial to the system itself. The requirements of GDP dictates a never-ending growth and consumption model. This is why the politicians and economists are always talking about growth and consumption when it comes to their opinion about what will create prosperity and a recovery of the so-called economy. But it's utterly unsustainable. 
Imagine a doctor sitting you down and telling you that you have widespread cancer throughout your body and in order for you to recover and be cured we need to increase the growth of your tumours. This is why John McMurtry referred to capitalism in this light in his book The Cancer Stage of Capitalism because cancer is the only other thing that exists that behaves exactly like our current monetary market system. What I have just listed is just a very small number of all the issues that we face as a species. And you know what? Even if you joined some campaign or movement that promoted some social change, the currently dominant perspective which promotes a static condition of human thought may cause the inhibition or even prevention of a decent and sustainable world during your lifetime. But we do it anyway. We know that it is a possibility that none of what we do would achieve the goal while we're alive, so therefore we're not personally benefiting from the fruits of our labour, and we even recognise that this could all be in vain. But we do it anyway. Why? Because it is for the betterment of potential future generations. We currently exist in a state of avoidable suffering. It is not in our destiny to suffer and die purely because we listened to those who said it was impossible or against our human nature. We are better than that. One word, humour. You know, uh, present a little bit of irony in there. Sort of like, say something that is blatantly false, but sort of uh, exaggerates the point of view of the mainstream. Like, say for example, if, uh, if, I mean, we all know that all politicians lie, and we all know that the mainstream media is, um, is composed of a lot of lies. Um, we the pieces of lies, yes. Yeah. <laughs> And, uh, and I basically say, this is an announcement from the mainstream, uh, mainstream media, everything that you hear is 100% true. Please do not question the mainstream media, they are not lying to you. And because we know that that's patently false, it gets people thinking, well, are they lying or are they really telling the truth? It's, it's the, uh, the enigmatic uh, words inside the box that say everything inside this box is a lie. Yeah. It, 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 it's, exactly. it, it's enough to trigger yeah. a, a response. So it, it, it's attracting people's attention and in a, and, and in a positive way. Ga gauging, their, gauging their thought processes. You know, and, uh, and basically when, I, when people ask me, um, I, I mean I dare say this might be the next question you're coming on to, but, uh, but just in case, if, uh, if not, I'll cover it here. When people ask me why I do what I do, um, to sum it up in one word, I mean, if it's just like a se single sentence answer they need, then I'll basically say, say this, that I'm at least trying to plant the seeds of critical thinking in people's minds so they look around and start questioning the system we live in. And that's basically the, the short you know the short version of it and um, a lot of the time they engage me in a, in a discussion and say well you know where do your, um, where do your uh, thought processes come from and, and all that sort of stuff and I, I mean there was one guy last week I was talking to him for about two hours my record in like having a having a just in the middle of the street discussion with someone is about I think four and a half hours I, I, I you're wonderful people guys, remember that, every single one of you, I repeat, every single one of you is a beautiful human being. Do not let anyone tell you any different. In a sense, I see my street activism as a kind of public service. Um, I'm doing what I can with this life that I have, because I know that there are certain things that I've been conditioned to want throughout my life and realise that they're unattainable. So, you know, it's, I mean, I, I guess it's encapsulated a bit when, uh, when, when I'm talking to someone and, uh, and I ask them, so what do you do? And generally when 
when you hear that question you think oh he's asking what I'm doing what I do for a living so they explain their job and I go uh, and I do this deliberately where I basically you know set them up to subliminally tell me what they do as a job and then I go actually sorry I, I didn't mean what you do for a job I mean what uh, I didn't mean what you do for a living I mean what do you do for humanity and it, it's sort of they go hmm I'll get back to you on that one <laughs> so, I mean like, I've had like you know some interesting responses to that but it's sort of it gets it brings people off their script as it were because um, I mean like there's some interactions I've had with religious people and one of the successful ways of being able to share communications well with a religious person is to get them off their script and engage them on an intellectual level um, but I kind of try and do try and do that with people and do it in a way that you know I'm you know I'm a receptive human being I recognize that you are also because we're both the same on the fundamental level let's talk Essentially, humanity has two options, evolve or perish, grow up or die. I recognise that as a species we are currently fixed on a road to ruin. We barrel down this road with such reckless abandon that we forget the real reason we're taking this journey to begin with. Most of us, unfortunately, will exist and then die, not having grasped the why of things. I'm not saying I have the full picture, but I know that a justification is important. In other words, we need to be conscious and do things for the right reasons. Not because it's convenient and safe, because that is the perfect mindset to create slaves. I recognise that we must have respect for the natural laws, one of which is known as causality. If we pollute our biosphere and consume too much of its natural resources at a near exponential rate, then we're going to burn out and the accelerant on this cultural fire is the illusion of economic growth, GDP, fractional reserve banking, debt and the value system to keep the wheels on this ignorant and arrogant runaway train laughably referred to as an economy spinning faster and faster until the whole locomotive system itself either runs out of fuel and grinds to a halt or the worst case scenario goes so fast that it rips right off the track. That's the long and short of it really, but as I've described earlier, there are a myriad of problems that we can even perceive clearly as problems. The trick of solving them is in finding, addressing and eradicating the root cause of any respective problem. For example, if you have a disease epidemic on your hands, you need to isolate the viral entity itself to see what it is you're dealing with, and finding the original host organism is critical in creating an antiserum. If we don't engage ourselves in a very similar task on a societal level, then we have a very difficult and final destination ahead of us in the form of extinction. The other alternative is if we embrace our resource and technological capacity to create a high standard of living for everyone on the planet. Our capabilities are so vast in this regard that any single one of the four best renewable baseload energy generation mediums, that being geothermal, wind, solar and water, easily has the potential, if harnessed properly, to meet and even exceed our current global energy demand. This shift in methodology is preempted by a shift in our value systems towards sustainability, empathy and non-violent behaviour holds the key to not only humanity's survival but its prosperity and freedom. We are capable now of so much more than the media lets on because after all the media is the indoctrination arm of the establishment itself and in such a world of access, abundance and sustainability, such a need for a central media to control perceptions and steer public consensus would have no basis to exist. People would be free to live their lives however they want within the constraints of the laws of nature. A world where seemingly anything is possible, where human life is nurtured, respected and assisted in line with the compassionate values of what the human species really is, which is a family. To survive and thus also thrive, we need to work together, and such a world will have such cooperation and collaboration as a central value. 
not just because we all share this planet and thus must realise that it serves no one and nothing to alienate yourself from society, but also because when you contribute towards the betterment of society, that also comes back to better your own life. And it's not even like everyone is required to keep things running. The exponentially growing trends of science and technology are fast negating the very need for human labour. After all, those are the jobs that waste human life, so why waste your life doing something that a machine can do far better? That means that you're free to travel, play games, spend time with the family, experience things, learn things, invent things, express yourself, and so much more. In fact, I think in such a sustainable world, people simply won't have time for all the wonderful and enriching things they can do with their lives because the constraints of socioeconomic status, geographical isolation, psychological inhibition and stunted emotional growth either no longer exist or in the least only exist to a minimal extent. Would you like to live in this kind of world? Oh, no. um, the the MPs we have at the moment, the members of Parliament uh, that we have, they're, they're I mean they're they're just mostly businessmen, really. It, what what problems can business technically solve? You know, it's it's all about. I mean, business is all about you know enterprise and you know uh, within a monetary system. I mean, that's not an empirical for life on this planet. I mean, there are there are cultures on this planet that live without monetary systems and they get along just fine, you know? So, and, and I mean, advocating a resource-based economy doesn't mean that we're going back to that. It means that we're, you know, we're returning in a sense in our values to the sort of egalitarian, um, I, I hate to say the word collectivist, but, uh, but the sort of, you know, recognition that we're all one on this on this planet as a species. Um, so to have a system that actually takes that into consideration. Um, but MPs don't know how to do that. You know, they don't. Their their orientation is towards business. So the other MPs, the megaphone persons. Um, I mean, it is it's a good title. It's a good title. I mean, I've. You know, I, I mean, I think I put that up on my uh, Facebook because uh, Paul uh, told me about that at that time. It was like, uh, do you want to be called a megaphone person? I'm like, fuck yeah. Uh, and um, and I'd, I'd say, yeah, I mean, a, a megaphone person is far more representative of the people because he is, or he or she is one of them. You know, I mean, some people think, oh no, that's that's the that's the point of um, of the Senate. It's like, you know, because the Senate is supposed to be like, you know, uh, ordinary people making decisions for the people because they are some of the people. And uh, one of the scenes from Gladiator says that, uh, you know, uh, Commodus basically tells them that no, they're not one of the they're not one of the people because they live a far more blessed life than any of the other Roman peasants. So, sorry bullshit um, so yeah I mean and, and a, and a mega pu megaphone person likes to interact with other people likes to learn about the system we have likes to learn about human behavior and psychology and how um, you know what's good what's bad well you know what's what's negative and what's positive not good or bad because that's the thing the, uh, the the governments of this world try to uh, make you feel fearful of uh, other people uh, I don't know especially the uh, the people in the Middle East as we call it uh, they try to label these people as terrorists and try and make us think that you know that they pose a threat to us and thus in response we have to attack them to stop them attacking us but here's the thing they don't pose a threat to us they don't the true terrorists of this world do not wear, you know, turbans and have long beards and scream Allah Akbar before blowing themselves up. The real terrorists of this world don't do that. The real terrorists of this world wear multi-thousand pound suits and work in the highest levels of government and banking.
those are the true terrorists of this world. Do you know why? Because they're creating money out of thin air every single day whenever a deposit or loan occurs in the banking system, thus causing inflation, thus devaluing the, uh, you know, our currency, forcing all of us into indentured servitude and inevitably leading to the collapse of the entire monetary system. Those are the true terrorists of this world and we put them in charge of us. Why do we put other people in charge of us? Shouldn't we be evolved to the point where we can look after ourselves and govern ourselves and love ourselves instead of, you know, looking for people to blame for the problems that we have and like point fingers saying, oh no, you're to blame, you're to blame. Why should we have to do that? We shouldn't have to. We really shouldn't have to. Do you know why? Because we're all human beings. We're all the same on the fundamental level. We all need to embrace each other as one. Because we are one. Because underneath the skin, what is different between you and a Muslim? Nothing. What is the difference under the skin between you and an evangelical Christian? Nothing. What is the difference under the skin between you and a Sikh? Nothing. We are all the same. We must all embrace each other and we need to stop pointing the finger of blame. If we need to point the finger of blame anywhere, it needs to be right at ourselves because we allow this system of separation and fear to carry on. We should not let fear control us. We need to embrace love instead. I wouldn't even use the word breaking down the barriers, but uh, encouraging the barriers to be lowered. Yeah, I mean, because uh, I mean, some people can. I mean, just like we were just uh, hinting on a, a second ago with semantics about um, the effect that certain words can have. The very, the very phrase "breaking down barriers" it seems like an act of destruction, in a sense. When in fact, when it's a case of we're encouraging each other to lower our mm. barriers. I mean we can still have them because we will need them. Mm. You know, we do need to defend ourselves against certain things in our thought process. We shouldn't destroy the barriers, we just lower them when needed, you know, and then raise them when needed. This is normally the part in the documentary where you have some bleeding heart know it all sit you down and tell you that life is a bitch and there's nothing we can do to change it. So instead the trick is to develop coping strategies to anaesthetize us against our suffering. In effect, you're someone with a potentially fatal brain tumour, but instead of operating to remove the tumour itself, your doctor is instead just telling you to take maximum doses of paracetamol, diclofenac and ibuprofen and carry on with your life. Just don't operate heavy machinery and don't bother your little mind with worries that are beyond your understanding. We have everything under control. That is the reality of living in this current system. When you are born, you are roped into a split identity of an actor who doesn't even realize they're acting within the overall framework of an elaborate socio-economic stage. Your character serves a function in this performance. Consumption. For you are a consumer. There are differing levels in this structure, and because this structure is not designed for everyone to enjoy life on the same level, the rewards for the stratification are as integral to the functioning of the system as the infrastructure itself. Its form has the circuits of wealth, resources and power arranged this way. You cannot hope to rewire such a structure without either compromising the functioning of its grid or the tendencies of us to tinker when we know there's certain rewards for it would cause the same configuration to emerge back into being yet again. This is why a shift away from the need for such a self-destructive structure is so critical to not only our survival but the ensuring of a long, happy, productive and inspirational life for everyone. I have learnt that things can be better. Yes, they can. It's just a matter of how much you want it, because you need it. We have to be willing to change ourselves based on a running check of our behaviour to assess whether what we do in life is positive and productive. For some reason we seem to think that we do this already, 
However, there are many examples of how inhumanity and horrific behaviour is almost invisible to a culture purely on the basis of the fact that it's all they've ever known. Future generations, if we survive to create them, will look back on our current society and they will be horrified at some of the stuff that we do that we see as perfectly normal and thus acceptable. If this sounds unlikely or unrealistic to you, imagine actually thinking that there is such thing as a fat man on a sleigh being towed through the air by reindeer that freezes time so he can complete a global courier run to all the good boys and girls and deliberately miss all the bad ones. Imagine actually thinking that there is such thing as a fairy that comes into your bedroom while you're sleeping and buys a biologically jettisoned tooth from under your pillow. I could go on and on. But you would consider the stance of actually believing those concepts to be true as asinine and ridiculous. And these were the standard and most commonly taught delusions potentially from your own childhood. So how about actions, beliefs and traditions that existed, say, 100 years ago? We generally perceive a lot of values from that time to be completely irrational, bigoted and quote-unquote evil. To consider someone whose skin has a different pigmentation as somehow different and thus inferior, or that people with a different set of reproductive organs are somehow not deserving of respect just like anyone else, show up just as ridiculous. We recognise those things are bad. So what makes us think that we've reached the apex of social and technological development? We are a distance from achieving a state of true stewardship of this planet to truly call ourselves civilized. But I think we're getting there. We are slowly waking up to the fact that life is what you make of it, and that it takes a group effort because we are a group. Like it or not, we share this planet with billions and billions of other forms of life, and in order to thrive, we need to discover what the balance is. We need to discover for ourselves the correct means to maximise the well-being of all life on Earth. It sounds like a daunting task. However, just like any piece of music, each respective element may sound inadequate and insignificant in isolation. However, as an intelligently positioned part of a whole, its place and function serve to complement those it interacts with and creates a positive synergy that then culminates in a viral tendency towards sustainability, positivity and progress. Life isn't a bitch. We make her a bitch by abusing her. We waste her time and hours dilly-dallying while playing ego games and hoarding stuff and if we're not careful, she will dump our sorry ass and kick us to the cosmic curb, nothing but the remnants of a hopeful dream that never made its mark. I find it a, a wonderful learning experience talking to different kinds of people. I mean, I've interacted with people who are bankers and, like, you know, um, they look like they're really wealthy. You know, they're wearing, like, a really nice suit and then um, they got, like, a, you know, they have a suitcase and an umbrella and, and they just need a fucking bowler hat. And then, you know, um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, um, and I've also spoken to vagrants. And, um, and and realise the humanity in all of them and it doesn't matter where your social and economic standing is you are still a human being you still deserve to be treated with the respect and a, you know and, um, and loving energy that you know that will help all of us grow and learn and progress as a species so it's it's that sort of foreknowledge that helps me sort of, you know, sort of go with the flow, as it were, um, and sort of allow things to, to come back and forth and think you know, information to be exchanged and and hopefully try try our best to, you know, go away thinking, yeah, he was he was an alright guy, sort of thing, both both on my part and on their part as well. Um, so, you know, and also and offering free hugs has been a wonderful tool 
in interacting well with people when I offer them a hug it really sort of like disarms them and introduces the, the sort of thing where I'm saying you know I'm an open human being I would like to share you know a moment of comfort with you and a moment of sort of like uh, reassurance it's all a matter of choice I mean that's why I say it's completely 100% voluntary I mean I don't even go up and ask people if they want a hug I just have the sign I mean there are some people who I, if I notice that they, they do like a double take and a triple take and they sort of like hang around a bit and if they're actually engaging me in eye contact I do say would you like a hug because then the contact's already established but I don't offer any hugs verbally I just have the sign because I want people if, if I was going to give someone a hug I want it to be 100% their choice and because the thing is that, you know looking around you don't know what people are going through you don't know what sort of you know shit they're having to deal with in their lives. So, and some people they might be of the of the you know uh, of the unfortunate circumstance that their mind is developed in a very meager uh, meager manner, and uh, and they're they're quite suggestible to requests or demands or things like that. But they also have personal space issues that if someone touched them, they would have a negative reaction against that physical contact. So, for example, if you were of that persuasion and I asked you for a hug, you'd, you in in sub, um, subconsciously you'd be thinking, no, we don't like physical contact. But then your conscious mind will be like, yeah, well, I've got to do this sort of thing. And through um, through your own inaction there, you have actually violated part of their um, part. You know, you've actually harmed them on a on a psychological level. And I don't want don't want to do that. So if people want a hug. They will, you know. So it's making sure that you're open and, and, and receptive to. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it it results in me not giving out as many hugs, but it's more about quality than quantity. I mean, granted, I always I have a little um, hand tally counter that I that I use to basically keep count of the amount of hugs I I get and and give out. But uh, but it's also a case of you know. I don't care if I give a hundred hugs or only twenty. That's why I'm out here today, expressing that that feeling of unconditional love and giving out free hugs to anyone who wants one. It's an antidote to the fear that you've been taught to hold true in your minds by society, by the media, by your conditioning. It's time to let go of fear. It's holding us back. And the fear is a big factor to begin with. Uh, when I when I first started megaphoning, it took me. I mean, I basically got my. Um, I basically approached the uh, the bandstand in Worthing, and I got the megaphone out. Um, I had my bag around my around my shoulder and the megaphone in my hand, and I was basically pacing back and forth for about ten minutes. And because I knew that the second I lifted the megaphone up to my lips. I'm committed and I can't just like go oh, crap. you know because I've, I've already committed once I've done that so I was just like oh but what you know what happens if someone comes along and hits me or something oh I don't know I had all these paranoid thoughts going through my head but then I just thought screw it I'm gonna do this let's go so I think and lifted it up and you know once, once you get into the swing of it it's fine so really the advice I would offer people if uh, if they really do want to pursue uh, megaphone activism, um, I'm going to be uh, I'm going to be producing a video um, soon called "The Do's and Don'ts of Street Activism," and part of that is going to be uh, you know megaphone etiquette. But uh, but in terms of the fear, it's only temporary. It really is only temporary. I mean, it's a bit like you know. The, a bit like someone who who trains to be an actor and uh, and like before every performance they'd have stage fright and uh, you know they have like the nerves and everything but the more they do it the more they get over it and but it's not just about nerves it's fear of doing something that is unusual doing something that goes against the grain doing something that is 
you know, it questions the status quo. And we're taught not to rock the boat. So we we have that sort of it's it's kind of like the fear that's installed in the minds of religious people. The fear that people have uh, in religious circles is when they start fearing the idea of questioning their own beliefs. I mean, that's the only unforgivable sin. So when you, as long as you have the right mentality about it, being that you want that you have to wish to communicate with other people, not just to offer out information, but also to make it, make it completely clear that you are open to receiving information. You want to learn, you want to grow, you want to, you want to educate and be educated. And, um, and through that, uh, that knowledge and knowing about, um, about the, the law as well and what you're able to do, what you're not able to do, where you can do it, how long you can do it for, blah, 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 even though how long you can do it for is a bit redundant because you can do whatever you want as long as you want up, up until like a certain time at night. But, uh, but who wants to be doing megaphone activism at night? So that's that. Uh, and have you ever been hit? Has anybody ever come up and hit you? No. Okay, I just, 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 yeah. uh, I'd, uh, I'd, I'd clear that one it's, up. It's come close. <laughs> People have reacted in a way where they've, uh, they've all, like, you know, they like really squared up to me, and I've basically just put the megaphone in between myself and them, and put on the siren. <laughs> yeah, I did that to one uh, gypsy teenager, because yeah, he was like squaring up with me. He was like with all his mates. There was about 25 of them, and uh, they were, they all had their tops off. It was like really sunny and basically squared off, squared off from me, and I was just like, well, "Look, there's, there's no point. I'm a human being just like you. Calm down. It's not resort to violence, please." And, and given looked, looked over to the security guards. Guys, there's, you know, this is on CCTV. This is a breach of my peace. Can you do something about this, please? Uh, you know, trying to call upon the, uh, the services of those who are actually oath sworn to protect human rights. Uh, if you've got a siren on your megaphone, at least you can let them know where it'll end up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but that's but yeah, that's basically my my story so far. As I said previous, it starts with a positive attitude that it can happen. The value shift must first occur within yourself. At the risk of sounding cliche, it's summed up by the Mohandas Gandhi quote: "You must be the change you wish to see in the world," because that is. The initial understanding you must first come to, at least at some point in your life, if you hope to make things better, even if just for yourself. I've explained this in previous presentations that I have given, but let's elaborate on those principles of embodying the kind of future you want, because unless we can't do that, I don't see how it will be possible without unnecessary suffering. This isn't something that's just down to one person. Ironic, considering that when you generally provide a call to action to an average apathetic consumer, they will either throw up their hands and say, I'm just one person, I can't change things, that's a direct quote by the way, or they would pin all the responsibility upon you to demonstrate that you can change the world single-handedly and explain it to them in 10 seconds in a way that will be exactly what they want to hear. In effect, if you engage this kind of person in a manner that would inspire a change of thought and methodology, you will be met with either a statement of absolute insignificance due to a despotic mathematical conclusion of being utterly outnumbered by everyone, or they hold up an expectation of you to deliver the impossible, very much like what we expect of a god. This is just one of the value distortions we very well may deal with on the path of being active in social change, and we cannot expect to succeed unless we recognise and respect each other for what and who we are. We are all in this together. In fact, in a sense, we are game pieces on the largest, most complex and interconnected game board of so-called intelligent life that we know by the name of society. We each have our own unique talents, qualities and ways of thinking, and in order to function well as a team, we must all pull together like one. To work for the betterment of everyone and by association yourself as well, self-interest becomes social interest, 
In other words, you recognize that what you do for others does the same for you. If you put out negativity, you will get that back. Not because you deserve it, but if you piss in a swimming pool, you will also be swimming in piss. It's this little understood and lesser respective natural law of causality. But as I said, we each have our own abilities as well, so why not embrace the technological capability to provide for all life needs and from there we can all be free to become who and what we have always wanted to be, happy and free. This isn't some lofty utopian dream, this is a technical reality that needs to be implemented and we cannot get there with all of us being the same or not showing and growing our own unique talents. A game of chess is not won by being all of one single game piece, it takes a combination of them. A group possessing differing skills, being respected and engaged in cooperation. A successful, strategic and even dare I say artistic game plan is one that succeeds in creating the conditions where everyone will be provided for. And yes, I very much agree, this all sounds all very well and good, but how? As I mentioned prior, I have given two presentations on the topic, and there are a few others who have as well. The trains of thought are out there, they just need widespread support. Community is an important and central consideration if we hope to survive. A community of people working together are a community who will survive. But ultimately, this film isn't about showing you what I've done and what I'm doing. It's about inspiring you to do what you know to assist in making this world a better place and actually doing it. When we ask the question, how do we make the world better, the best person you should be asking is you. And if you don't know, then ask yourself why. And once you ascertain the why of what is holding you back, you can overcome that reason and be free to implement those changes. I am making this film because I see that this society is not what it can be, and it is in fact moving in a very dark and self-destructive direction. I see the evidence for this all around me because I am driven to know things and search for truth and resolution of suffering. The time has come to move beyond the outdated and immoral structure of indentured servitude, debt and suffering. In my four years of activism so far, I know I have caused positive changes because of what I've received as feedback from the society. I have received thanks from the grateful, attacks from the ignorant, questions from the inquisitive, rejection from the superficial, and acknowledgement from the intelligent. And what's more, you have no idea the effect you can have by merely living your own life. If you are walking down the high street and take a wrong step in someone's path, you can have a negative impact, and vice versa. So the slightest of interactions can have effects we seldom recognize. So consider how positive a hug can be. It's a voluntary, quick, and free exchange of tactile contact that has proven neurological and thus psychological and emotional benefits. And when we apply memory to recall those hugs, we relive the positive experience and thus recreate the effect. The hug is the real gift that keeps on giving. Now I have just described one tool we have, but there are many tools at our disposal. Will you have a peruse of them and take up what best fits in your hands? When we all take up our own tools of social evolution, we become a better unit, a greater whole due to the fractal change in its constituent parts and vice versa. Many different organisations, charities and movements exist to assist in these processes of change, so we need to unify them in a common recognition that we are one planet and thus one family. The one movement which to me is aiming the furthest and more correctly towards true positive social change is the Zeitgeist Movement. But you know what? Our goal is not to preserve institutions. So with this in mind, we should be aiming not to keep social movements going, but to use them to create the conditions where they are no longer required. A true economy is possible, as long as we embrace our human and technological means to provide for all humanity. I long for and work towards a world without the need for any charity or special interest group. 
but rather a world where the idea of them is ridiculous as using crutches to walk after a broken leg has been fully repaired. We have to work together as equal members of one huge interconnected global planetary family, which is what we are. So I ask you, viewer, what are you going to do to make the world a better place? You don't have to do the same as me or even as much as me. We each have our own choices that we make. So are we making the right ones? And together we can move forwards towards a sustainable, humane and prosperous world. Will we reach the goal of sustainability or will we fall short of what nature demands of us and thus perish? What are the immutable human needs we all share? How do we meet those needs while respecting others? How do we move forward as a species? Either way, facing these questions is part and parcel with life on the soapbox.